Who knows what Jay-Z, J.K. Rowling, Bill Gates and Oprah Winfrey all have in common? Okay, I will tell you then. They have all overcome failure in one shape or form to go on to gain success in their respective careers. Welcome to My Perfect Failure. Join us as we delve into the world of our perfect failures. We will interview, explore, and discuss how our perfect failures can lead us to success. Join us and tune in. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of My Perfect Failure. Today, I'm super excited because we have another amazing guest for you. So, my guest today is a marketing and communications expert and author of Simply Put, Why Clever Messages Win and How to Design Them. He's an experienced marketing executive and educator on a mission to get leaders to more effectively connect by simplifying their messages. His former co-founder and sorry, he is a former co-founder and managing partner at Digital Native Group, an award-winning agency that worked with the, the NFL I Love New York, Comcast, NBC, Universal, Hatchet Book, Group, The Nature, Conversancy, and other major clients. Currently, he teaches digital marketing at, I think it's Burke College in New York City, and consults with a range of thought leaders, venture-backed startups, and other brands. So a very, 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 very warm welcome to My Perfect Failure, Ben Gutman. How are you, Ben? Hi, Paul. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Well, I'm I'm super excited to have you, and I'm I'm, I'm excited to kind of I've got all these blanks in my brain about messaging because I not that I I don't view myself as a creative, but I think we live in a world today. I think I'm going to steal this off you a bit. Actually, I'm sure you said this, but everybody should be creative because whether we work in a business or we're you know on social media, we all are trying to project ourselves on a in a good way and I think it can be a bit of a struggle and we're going to get into your book which I'm excited to do you I, you have very kindly given me a, a snippet of it I know it's coming out imminently but I think that you yeah, simply put and I think that there is a tendency in my opinion mm. that everybody wants to be kind of quite I don't know bold and just creative and a little bit out there and I'm not sure what tra- I'm not sure that yields the engagement or the or what they're trying to achieve but but you, you know the secret source behind this so I'm keen to get into that so so anyway so excited to meet you today so my, I guess my first question would be so university started your agency career mm-hmm. so t- tell me what that process was like to go from instead of going into maybe the corporate land or where maybe a lot of your colleagues we went into you decided to go and go down a really difficult route and start your own business oh yeah uh yeah thanks for having me i appreciate uh the the introduction and you mentioned you know about everybody being creative i think that is true um the, what i say in my book is uh this is a book that will live on the marketing shelf it yeah. is a book that will uh be certainly very useful if your job is in marketing uh, but it's also designed to be applicable to anybody who's a leader an entrepreneur an advocate uh, because in, in many ways, we're all marketers, right? We, we all have something we want to change in the world. And that could be as simple as us getting a promotion. That could be as simple as mm-hmm. making a sale, or it could be, you know, a big movement or, or uh, you know, inventing the future in revolutionary product. So absolutely true what you just said. Um, but yeah, going back to when I was in college, um, so I was the big like student government dork. And I was really into uh, what I was doing on campus as part of that. I, I was president my senior year. I was kind of, you know, loving doing all the little city government events and whatever. And I wasn't actually paying that much attention to what I wanted to do after, what kind of job I wanted to get, what kind of career I wanted to have. I did take marketing classes. I was a marketing major. Uh, and I knew kind of broadly that I wanted to do something in that space, but I didn't really know exactly what it would be. And I was really fortunate because I had a professor who basically came up to me and a friend one day and and he was an adjunct. He had his own agency um, just outside the city. And he basically said, Hey, I know you guys want to maybe start something. We need some help with digital. Maybe we can figure something out. And we got together, 
we had lunch, again, his partner came in, we went to their office and we eventually started to figure out a relationship where we set up shop in their basement. They had an extra space in the basement of their office building. Uh, and we took it, we put some folding tables down, we slapped our logo on the wall and we started to, you know, figure out our way to, to make money and to, and to, you know, uh, it, it invent how to make an agency because we didn't come from doing it before, which a lot of people, when they start an agency, have left another agency to go yeah, do it. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. Right. And they bring over clients, they bring over people, they bring over systems. Uh, but we were just a bunch of like 22 year old knuckleheads that were trying to figure it out. And so we, we had the mentorship of the folks upstairs. Yeah. Uh, we had some projects we worked on with them. But again, yeah, we were just, you know, we were too kind of stupid to do. Uh, the real kind of big stuff. They worked with big Fortune 500 yeah. brands. And we did a couple of things with them, but really we cut our teeth on like the local ice cream shop and the local camera shop and those types of things. Uh, but to to more directly answer your question of kind of why did I want to do that was uh, I, I'm very fortunate in that my entire lived experience, like nobody in my family's had like a normal job. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody... Uh, if you go, you know, down the line, like my father's an attorney and he has his own practice. My mother's a social worker who's been independent. Um, my grandfather on my father's side owned a couple diners, you know, in, in New York, uh, like uh, Jewish delis. My uh, grandfather on the other side was a psychiatrist who had his own practice. And like, and if you go back before that, you know, we had people who were grocers back in Czechoslovakia before the war and like, it keeps going. And so having that background was um was kind of what i just understood is like that's what you do is you go out and you kind of make your own business yeah. um and so there's a there's a big kind of uh cultural benefit uh that you get from that and a lot of like jewish families and stuff have this and the uh the the intangible benefit of that is that every time you come home for the holidays every time you see people they're not kind of poking you at the dinner table being like when are you gonna like, when are you gonna get a job yeah, it's, that's what when, I was thinking. when are you gonna go get a real job when you, and they support it so you know nobody was nobody's fabulously wealthy we were very you know comfortable suburban existence but it's not like you know we had I, the you know my father ran the biggest marketing agency in the world and then i go do it yeah. um yeah. it is but it is that kind of intangible like okay like this is how you you know how you incorporate like people have a little bit of a sense of that and so that that's a level of um of, of privilege that, that made it a lot more comfortable and so presumably that you would have had you know your peers whether it be from college or peers that you left university with but went into different careers and probably more logical environments how did you manage yourself when maybe things were a little bit more consistent for them they were kind mm -hmm. of doing a nine to five and they were getting paid. You were obviously startup, so you're having to go and hunt for business, and pro probably you're having to buy things to kind of maintain the business. So I am imagine that your two, you know, two two three years out of university, your journey probably would have been a bit more bumpy than, mm -hmm. than, than theirs. Did you ever compare and think actually maybe that would have been something to consider also? Oh, absolutely. Right. Like, absolutely. Um, the, you know, the average peer of mine that left uh, Baruch College, which is where I went and where I now teach, um, they would go, nothing's wrong with it. They would go out and they would get a job somewhere. You know, everybody yeah. I sat next to my marketing class would go work at an agency or somewhere, or go work client side. People, it's a big feeder school for accounting and for finance. And so everybody would go and have the like 10 companies that they really want to work mm -hmm. for. And they, they're all competing for those jobs. Um, and when I would hang out with them six months, 12 months, 18 months after they graduate, I'm making a lot less money, right? Like mm -hmm. I, um, it, the nice part about an agency, and this is something that anybody who runs a service, a professional services business will understand is you don't really need a lot. You don't need a factory. You don't need yeah, a warehouse. Yeah. You don't need a storefront. You don't need, you know, a ton of inventory. You need a computer and some like business cards, right? It's not, mm -hmm. it's not a particularly capital intensive business. So we were fortunate that we never really lost money. Yeah. We would 
fail to make money sometimes, but for the most part, we never we were never really in the hole too much. But you're in the hole relatively, considering okay, you know what? Hey, my friend just got a job somewhere and they're making you know X amount of dollars. I'm making half X amount of dollars this year. Um, and, but we we would talk about this. Me and my partner is um, there be this line that everybody who got a job kind of would tend to be on this uh, linear path for yeah. for you know promotions and for raises and whatever. And so they would make more money in this while, but eventually, you know, we were we made less for a while, and eventually we started making more money. Yeah. Than a lot of our peers, have, have we done that? So it's a trade off. You make yeah, a little absolutely. bit less, yeah, and then eventually you make a little bit more. Um, and, and you have to be in a service business, um, in a startup, you have to be okay with um, variable, unpredictable uh, uh, compensation structures. So, and I was working with somebody in the beginning who we quickly realized wasn't going to be a good fit because he just wasn't as comfortable with that. He was, he, some people can be a lot more comfortable yeah. of not getting paid for two or three weeks and just understand that sometimes you're going to get paid a bunch and you're not going to get paid. You got to go hunt, you got to go hunt what you eat, you know, um, but some people that they need the psychological stability of having the paycheck. And there's nothing wrong with either one of those. Um, it's just, you know, have being predisposed for one or the other uh, will make that type of journey harder or easier. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I know that I've done that journey independently, but I can imagine that, the obvious benefit to me is that if you're starting your own business, you're you're, you're pretty much your own boss, not a p- partner or partners. And also the luxury is you get the the benefit of creating your own strategy. You're not beholden to people maybe who you don't actually agree with what they're saying, completely agree. And you've got to kind of execute something that you may think, actually, I know this isn't going to work, but I've got to do it because they you know my paycheck comes from them and and i guess you have to be to your point where one of your colleagues needed that consistency that reassurance Mm -hmm. of a paycheck i guess it's a journey that you start off and the consistency isn't there then hopefully if you if the business can survive over a period of time you'll get to a more consistent place where hopefully the revenue i guess revenue salaries etc become more consistent so 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 in line with this show my perfect failure there must have been some failures and some challenges along the way that maybe you know maybe it was an email or a phone call or a meeting are there any things that spring to mind to you for you oh i mean a million right i mean we (laughs) when you're dealing with uh clients who are have diverse backgrounds diverse needs um, and diverse budgets, and you 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 on your own side of things also mm-hmm. have you know a bunch of a cast of characters that are interesting and, and you know constraints and goals that and everything else that kind of gets thrown in the mix. It's a miracle that anything ever gets done. In, yeah, in that type of environment. But the the things that stand out to me, I mean, was, every year you would have one or two clients that just wouldn't work out, right? Mm-hmm. You, you somebody. Um, you know, somebody, we had one client that was like, yeah, the, the, the guy that worked there was such a jerk to our female employees. And he was nice to me, but he was a jerk to our female employees. And we're like, yeah, we can't have you do this. Like, mm-hmm. like this is, you're, you're destroying morale here. You're being a dick. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we're not going to work with you. And so we would end that type of project, uh, that type of thing happened. And that's not so much a failure in terms of like, I made this mistake and something that's else, but you make a mistake in vetting people a little bit, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I guess um, they get to, yeah. But the, the things that are interesting. So, so we had an agency, we ran it for 10 years, uh, had lots of great clients, lots of employees. It was you know cool that's office, all the, all the trappings of it. What was that? I was just thinking about the bio, some of the clients that I run at NFL. Oh Yeah. Some great, I mean, great people, great, great brands. It was, it was an excellent ride. But that being said, almost everybody I know that has done some sort of agency business at some point has the desire to be like, I kind of want to do a product instead. I kind of want to be an investor. I kind of want to be a, you know, have a piece of software or something that we do. And they're inspired by, there are a number of very, successful models where people were agencies and then they pivot into a product business. 
uh, base camp from 37 signals. Like that's, that's, a, you know, the example that a lot of people point to. Um, MailChimp was, was a version of that. Um, and so everybody looks and says, Hey, well, I really, you know, we have all the ability here to make products So we have designers and developers and, and marketing people, of course, but we, you know, the, the, we, we have to make our money the other way in terms of the agency stuff. And it would be so much nicer if you didn't have to deal with the clients, you didn't have to deal with the hunting and chasing of every contract, if you just had some sort of product. And so over the years, we tried uh, at least two distinct products. And there was another one that kind of, we left in the planning phase that, um, that were supposed to be kind of our ticket to doing, to doing that route of things, that more kind of startup -y, yeah. uh, route. And I actually, I liked, you know, I'll tell you what they were. So one product was for colleges because I mentioned being kind of student government dork before. Uh, I saw that there was a need for a some sort of kind of campus communications platform oriented around student uh, student organizations. And, you know, because that's what I knew, right? I was like, yeah. I was in the student government space. Uh, and there kind of was, right? There, there's a little bit. I mean, different schools have these different platforms, uh, but they weren't really great. And I thought we could do something better. So we put the other piece of software uh, that was okay. It was pretty good. I mean, it was 2012 or 13 or whatever it was when we were doing it. Put out this piece of software and we sold it. We, we got a license to one school. And it was it was running, it was live, people used it, it was okay. And we kept on going around. We're like, okay, great, we got this one school, we have this case study. Let's go to school number two and three and four. And the problem is schools are really slow. The budgets are not that big. And we just couldn't, and that was like not the best mm. product. Because you think the students as like as part of the inroads to it has to kind of be like ground up and students change over every year and it's a whole mess. So we yeah. We basically began to sunset that one, but we had another tool that we built for for K through twelve here in the state, so like primary school, the secondary school, um, and this one was much more of an administrative tool. The idea was like it was a single CMS for all of their external content, so it would feed. You know, you can go in and you can basically build your school's website your school district's website, you could um, you know, have a mobile app. What was that? Sounds amazing. Yeah, it was great. This is like 20, I don't know, 14 or something. Mm -hmm. like that. Um, it, it was, it was uh, we had a mobile app, we had a website. Eventually it spit off a few other things like digital signage or email or, and the idea was one CMS, you're the school principal, you can have, you can put stuff in there. Um, and, it, and it did okay. Also, we also had a paying client. We also had somebody that wanted to use it. Uh, parents used it, teachers used it, administrators used it. It was it was pretty effective. But again, the problem was schools are the slowest places on the planet. Yeah, yeah. The money is is not terrible. The money's not terrible there, but it's but it's not great either. And uh, you're dealing with like these very complex stakeholder relationships, procurement processes that take forever. Yeah. And you know the benefit of that if you're looking for for building a business in that space that also you know, it's hard as it is to get in it's that hard to get out right like they're you're not going to have somebody switching to a new platform uh you know in in a day it takes yeah. it takes you a year to get sold into a place and it will take a year for your replacement to get sold into a yeah. place so you start you get that money for a long time but it was just so so that one had a little more traction it be, but it started to go really it was but still going really really slowly and it was something that if you're an agency every day, hopefully every week, your phone's ringing with another lead. You know, somebody wants to hire you to build X or build Y or to you know, do a Z campaign. And that's just, that's hard to say no to. It's hard to say no to money mm -hmm. coming in today in exchange for building something that may work, may not work. We don't know, you know yeah. what the market's going to be for it. Uh, and eventually what we did was we said, okay, we're going to pivot that product from being this kind of big expansive thing. We're going to pivot it down to being just the digital signage component. And I really liked that product to be honest. That was, let's say like this great, you could, 
if, if it spit off a little signage feed and you played it on like a, you could play it on a Roku or like an Amazon fire stick and, and these schools could put a TV up in the hallway, put on a little Roku, like put in the code for the feed they want to put up and it would display things like, um, you know, upcoming events or the, the bell schedule or like the word of the day or those type of things. Um, and I, I thought it was a pretty interesting platform. We built it so that you could just, we get to take a credit card payment and, and go on it. And that got a little bit more traction. And, but then, you know, it's, it's I don't know, 10, 10 or 12 different paying um, uh, schools that were paying for it and people that liked it. But the problem was, that, you know, again, schools often don't have a credit card yeah. that they can put stuff on. They need to have an invoice for something. Yeah. And, and so you have to, every year you renew and it's a big pain in the ass and you're only charging a few hundred dollars a month for that platform. Uh, I think we're starting like five or six hundred dollars a month for that flop because the idea was okay. Let's get you know a bunch of these and and um, uh, you know, get them wide instead of going on for the bigger ticket. But again, the big problem in an agency is that you're going to have is the product that's the thing I want to do you know in the long run, or is the thing that I got to go make payroll, I got to go make rent, I got to go do that thing, and it's a tough trade off. Ultimately, what we decided to do was to spend more of our time uh, in the in the agency space. We we kind of mothballed the other product. Um, I probably have a little bit of a regret about it because it was really fun to work on, but it was not something that I regret the outcome necessarily because it ended up, you know, once we were once we put that aside and said, okay, you know what, that was a good run. We're going to focus on building the best agency we can run. Um, and, you know, maybe at one point later in life, come back to doing product things, but we wanted to focus on the agency piece. Um, that that also happened to be the moment where the agency stuff really picked up more and more. So, um, you know, it's a failure, but it's really yeah. just kind of a pivot point of anything else. Yeah. And I guess it's nice to, because if you hadn't looked into that or broached it and gone for the process, maybe now you'd be thinking you might, the agency would have done well, you'd have potentially sold it as you have done, but you might still be thinking we definitely should have gone down that product route as well because we could have done something else at least you've done that you've tested it you've gone through all the process because for me so i'm sorry i'm sure he, even steve jobs when he got fired from apple i'm sure one of the things that he did he built a platform for the education system i think it might have been called i don't know if it was the next product but it didn't work it was it was i think it was the same process where it, it, the, the the i think there was interest but the paint that it was the that process trying to get money out of schools the same in England they mm -hmm. they do have budget but it's a real minefield to mm -hmm. have the conversations then there's an administrative uh, trail you would go for that and that can be quite time consuming and I guess from an agency's world you, you want to move at a different pace mm -hmm. exactly I mean and the thing is you know education is uh it's a tough space for all those reasons. And the problem that results from that slowness, from that bureaucratic stuff, is that the the solutions that do get sold in to those institutions are usually not that good. Because it's not the best piece of software. It's not the best piece of technology yeah. or the best construction material, whatever it's going to be. It Schools don't get the best stuff. They get the stuff from the people who are the best at selling to schools mm -hmm. and that's the same for that's the same for hospitals that's the same for mm -hmm. um you know government agencies uh everywhere you look that there's a highly kind of regulated environment like that with a lot of bureaucratic red tape in it is the result is you get people who are optimized for that mm -hmm. not optimized for delivering really good software for instance um and you get you can get big enough where you can kind of do, i mean if you're microsoft you can you know apple facebook like you can walk and chew gum with those things but uh it's hard to be a small firm and every time i meet now a student or an entrepreneur that's considering going into that space i just kind of give them the word of warning on that which it's you're gonna you need to get cash flow when you're yeah. doing that type of thing uh, unless you're going to go get take a bunch of investment i mean that's a whole different route mm. and that's a route that a lot of companies take and um it, it's obviously kind of, you know, gives you a runway to do stuff, but now we're also in a different environment where investment can be a little bit harder to get uh, than it was even a couple of years ago. So the, 
if, if you need to get money fast to prove an idea, I, I mean, schools or government, I'm not, and I'm not saying anything revolutionary here, right? This is what, what anybody in business would know is that uh, schools, government institutions are, are not the yeah. quickest way to yeah. prove your idea. Yeah. If you want to try and find out, be our guest, but it might be, yeah. it might be a little bit, you might get a little bit frustrated along the way. Although a few conversations I've had recently with some universities, they've got like enterprise and incubator and types of departments that are that i guess that are trying to blend more into the entrepreneurial spirit but i would hazard a guess and say that although that you they've got that side to the business the process to access money and to do the things that you you're looking to do maybe others are looking to do potentially would fall they would encounter the same challenges so yeah mm-hmm. Okay, so simply put, so when did the idea or the notion that lots of us were simply that, that I said, put it again so we can see it nice and clear? <laughs> yeah, I, just, I finally and, have and, the there paper copies. There we go. Yeah. I, I love the um, it's a, it's a lovely title, and we're going to get into that in a second, but it's very nice and clear, not cluttered. You know what you're getting. So um, that that gets a tick. But when did your notion come into play that, you know, people can be a little bit too ambitious, a little bit too bold, a little bit too confusing with our messages? When did that appear for you? Oh, I mean, that's something that you you can see basically as a consumer of the world, right? As a user of the world, you see you see people that have a hard time kind of getting their point across all over the place. But running an agency and having clients every day knocking on your door asking about how you how they can you know tell the world about their widget about their their yeah. invention their their own book um you, you start to develop a little bit of a skill for that right and you realize that oftentimes i would sit in a client meeting and there'd be people who are working at this business for a decade 20 years 30 years and they I would ask something very simple, like describe your business, like tell me what do you do? Yeah. And like why why is it important? Who's your customer? Any of these kind of basic questions. And the amount of times that you can be in something so closely, you could be in in you know mm-hmm. in the thick of working on something, and you can't answer those questions about, you know, what, what, what do we sell? You know, what why are we better than everybody else's time? The kind of basic positioning questions. Um that you know that that was kind of a lot of times the the most value that we brought to a project mm-hmm. was not always like the deliverable, okay. but it was it was it was sitting in a meeting somewhere on a call of them and be like, oh, okay, so what you really do is X, right? And then, you know, as the outsider, as the the folks who are kind of translating what they're doing for the their audience, um, we ended up with uh, a perspective that that all of a sudden clarified everything that they were doing internally so i would see that happen all the time and and i talk about that uh what we used to call ourselves like enlightened idiots you know we're like listen we're idiot means the other person the, the outside yeah, yeah the common man like that's what we are we are enlightened idiots we are curious idiots we are okay. curious people who are on the outside and we are going to to kind of ask these questions that are going to lead towards towards getting that um getting that website headline, getting that Mm -hmm. slogan, getting that subtitle, whatever it's going to be, getting that out in a way that connects with people. And so you saw, I saw that, you know, I saw that as professional. I saw that as, um, you know, a a user of the world. I saw that as a professor. You know, I would talk to my students and I I would ask them to, you know, do a pitch for something. And and the work that I would get back is, you know, sometimes they had a hard time struggling Mm -hmm. with, with articulating different things. And so all these things came together and after I sold the business about a year and a half ago, uh, I started to dig into it a little bit saying, well, okay, why is it? Why is it that some messages work and others don't? You know, what, what, what makes the difference between the two of them? And how can we, you know, putting my, my backgrounds in design, how can I put the design hat on and develop guidelines and principles that allow us to create messages that fall in that first category that work? Okay, okay. So we've got lots of questions, lots of yeah. 
So do you think there was attendance? Well, I guess there's a I guess there's a lot of questions. So so clearly there are um, business owners, companies that maybe have got lost somewhere along the lines in terms of exactly what their business does or even how it's perceived to their consumer base. So if there's some confusion there and you've got a, maybe a, a cluttered or a confused or a busy busy messaging, then clearly you're not going to yield the results that you want. But also, is do you think simple somewhere along the way became maybe unsexy because everybody thinks they've got to come up with a bold, a really kind of out there concept messaging to kind of almost be too clever for ourselves. Um, I think that you're right, which is we have a default to add. So when you look at how this kind of works in our, in our brain, our psychology of this is we have, we are predisposed to favor simple things. It's called yeah. uh, co a processing fluency is mm -hmm. if it's something is easier for us to take from out in the world, put into our heads and make sense of if it is easier to read, if it is easier to hear, if it is, if there's better, this higher contrast of the font is different. If, if it's more pronounceable, all these things, which sometimes are, are very big and sometimes are very small, all these factors contribute to how much mental processing power we have to put in to understand a message. And when it takes more processing power, when it's harder for us to, to internalize a piece of uh, communication, we have a host of negative feelings okay. associated. We don't, we're less like, we're, we don't trust it. We don't, we don't want to buy it. We don't like it. Uh, and that is not what we ever want to do in our own messaging, right? On the other hand, if it is simple, if it's easily understood, perceived, and acted upon, if it is simple, we are you know, we're more likely to buy, we're more likely to donate, mm. we're more likely to vote, we're more likely to we trust it better, we like it better. And all of those things are those are the goals, right? And whenever we're wherever we're informing or persuading, um, we want people to to feel on that positive end of the spectrum. So that is the mechanism for what makes for an effective message. However, we have this bias towards the other way. Everything in our heads everything in our society points us in the other direction, which is, uh, which is to complicate. So I make the distinction mm -hmm. between complex mm -hmm. and complicated. Complex is, is, has a lot of parts. You know, there are complex things in the world. Um, the, you know, nuclear physics is complex, mm -hmm. but complicated is when something could be simple, but you added additional pieces. When you put more on, when you, when you add more layers or words, whatever it is, that's complication. Um, if, you know, the example is, you know, again, like nuclear physics is, is complex. The human eye is complex, but uh, the really bad like memo your boss sent about the PTO policies, uh, that's complicated because it could have been easier, right? The uh, pe people will do work for complex things. We do it all the time, right? If you ever, if you, um, you know, learn how to play the piano, if you read War and Peace, we put in the work for complex things, but it has to be worth it to us we won't put that effort in when it's something like a marketing message because we're just, we don't want it. We woke up today without having to spend money. You know, we don't, we didn't want to spend time listening to your ad. We didn't want to click on your banner. We didn't want to open your spam email. We wanted to do a lot of other things, but those weren't them. And so we're not going to put the effort in for that. We have to do something that's going to be easy. And, you know, we have in, in our own minds, we have, we have an additive bias. There's a number of studies that I cite in the book, which are really interesting when they talk about like uh, these researchers do experiments with Legos, they do it with mini golf, they do it with those kind of patterns on uh, on a screen uh, across all these different ways which we could manipulate stuff in the world. We have a bias to add. We have bias to add more, to complicate, because that's just, that's just where we first go for things. But then we also have the societal structures with everywhere we look, there are incentives to add. There's not the incentives to subtract because there's no evidence of absence. If you did a thing, if you added your paragraph to that report, if you added a slide to that presentation, you can point to that. You can tell your boss, you can tell the board, you can tell the newspaper yeah. that you did that thing. 
but you don't have the evidence of removing stuff, of simplifying stuff. And so when you look at, at how we judge the outcome of people's work, which is often like performance reviews and media clippings or whatever, removing doesn't get the headline. Removing doesn't get those, those get, doesn't get the bonus. So we are incentivized uh, internally and externally to complicate, even though it doesn't actually help us out in the end. Yeah. So have you had the experience where you work, you know, a client contacts you, says, I've got this amazing idea. When, when how quickly can we have a meeting? So you, so you have a meeting face-to-face -face or, or virtual like this. And they say, and they, and they maybe present you, this is what we want to do. How can you help us make this sexy and, you know, amazing? But you look and you look at it and you think, hmm not sure we can, I'm not sure where you're going to go with this or and you, you kind of like pretty much know instantly that their objectives are not going to be achieved does that has that ever happened to you um yeah I mean uh, you, you can tell a lot uh you can tell a lot but uh about a about the future success of a campaign or of a business mm -hmm. as a whole based off of the 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 person that you're talking to if that's mm -hmm. the founder or the ceo or you know if it's just somebody you know in the marketing department some young you know associate or whatever that's a different story but you, you need to have somebody that's going to be bought in to trusting you they're bought into investing that they are not doing they're not hiring you reluctantly they're hiring you enthusiastically is always a really important piece of it every time we've had somebody go and be like oh i don't want to hire an agency but i really need to get this thing done or like oh i'm really good at this but i'm hiring you because i'm too busy to do it. Yeah. anytime yeah. they come and they have that type <laughs> of attitude it's like it's a it's a big fat red flag to, yeah, to have that are they, are they um, going to interfere will they will, will they come up with my like, nitpick when they've got no idea like oh, me, yeah. i couldn't do what you do so one, I, oh man <laughs> one of the worst it. clients that i ever had and by listen we had we had i don't know over 100 clients from, over the years i loved all of them there, a lot of them were really wonderful people and i went to their weddings and like all sorts oh, of amazing. cool stuff but every now and then there's a dud right i mean someone yeah. before some guy who was a, being a jerk to our employees um and i had one that was personally a jerk to me a little bit would uh because he he was a, a very very brilliant um uh very brilliant scientist doctor you know medical researcher and he um he he had a background in i think he might have run a marketing agency with like the 80s or something like that right before he like went to medical school yeah, he did okay. some like design or something yeah. but he thought that he knew everything better than we did. And then listen, we, we may not know every single thing in the world, for, but we do. And we probably, we certainly don't. We're certainly not Nobody individually does. the best it's at every single thing. Learn, which is great. But this guy thought that he was the bee's knees about everything. And every time we presented something to him, he gave comeback of a bunch of feedback that was really not particularly good. Uh, it was a fee feedback. I, I actually, one of my biggest bones to pick in, in, in design circles is the people that complain about you know, designers that complain about feedback because listen, like, you know, your your job as a designer is to be able to get the feedback out of them and be able to respond to it. Uh, your job, you know, the client only hires designers, you know, once every few years, probably. And you do this every day. You, you know, you're used to be the expert in it. So I always, I always kind of chastise design, like especially younger designers when I see them and they complain about like, oh, this guy gave me this feedback. It's like, no, I don't want to hear, you know, you, you have to be the professional here. But that's an aside. This guy would come and every single thing was a problem. Every single thing was, you know, he wanted to do his own mock-ups for something. And it was, um, and while he was a genius in one area, he was not particularly good mm. in this area, but they, he thought he was, he knew everything about this. And he thought he knew everything about copywriting. He thought he knew everything about advertising. And uh, that's the type of talk about, you know, red flag is, if somebody comes in and they think that they're going to, that they could do your job better than you. And that applies to anything, right? You, you know, you're, you're a bad, you're a bad patient for a doctor. If you think that, you know, better than the doctor, you know, if you're, you're a bad you know client for an attorney. You think, you know, you know, more than the lawyer does, uh, but it applies to, for, you know, it applies to our industry a lot too, which is somebody comes in saying, I know all the, I know exactly what I want to do. I know everything about it. I just, you know, I just have to hire you because I have to hire you. 
that, that's always going to be a bad bad time. So clear red flags. If if your client thinks they know it better than you, but but they're just too busy, that's a that's a red flag. Maybe you want to um, maybe look for a different client. So in your book, you talk a little bit about senders and receivers. Could you maybe elaborate on that? Yeah, so I break down, I appropriately I simplify the uh, language we use when it comes to communicating, like just looking logically, looking from a design perspective at communicating. There's only two ends of it. There's the sender and the receiver, right? The sender is the one who has the message. This could be a marketer. This could be a leader. This could be an advocate. This could be a politician. This could be a parent. This could be a friend. They're the one who has the who has the message and is sending it, and the receiver is the person on the other end of it, right? They're the they're the voter, they're the buyer, they're the donor, they're the the spouse, whatever it is. And we just have to understand that we're 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 always both, right? In the same in this conversation, I'm receiving or you're sending, and you send and I receive, and back and forth. Um, and that um, so you, when you start to clarify saying there's really only two parts of this puzzle. Um, who is responsible for the success of the communication? Well, it's, it's the sender. If, if you were to mail a letter, it's your responsibility as the sender to pay for the postage, to pay to package up the envelope, to, uh, to drop it off at the post office. Uh, and just as you bear the you know, physical and metaphorical cost in that scenario, um, you do it as well when you're communicating like this. And so it's your responsibility as a sender to make sure that you're talking, you're writing, you're presenting in a way that benefits the receiver, that you're doing, you're doing the heavy lifting. You're, you're doing the simplification. Yeah. You're doing the, you're making sure it's focused. You're making sure it's salient. You're making sure it's empathetic. Um, all those things are your responsibility. And, uh, and because the sender, the, sorry, the receiver woke up today again, not wanting to hear what you have to say. We care about lots of things in our lives. We care about our friends, our family, our sports teams, uh, politicians, our favorite food, whatever it's going to be. We don't care about most of the thousands of other messages that we are hearing on a daily basis. So you have to make sure that it does fit in somebody's life like that. I think that's such a key statement to me because every medium of engagement, whether it be internet, social media, television, radio, print, everybody thinks that their message is the best thing since all their product, their message, their service, whatever it is, is the best thing since sliced bread. But they don't maybe think, to your point, that people don't care. So your messaging, if you're a sender, has to be really on point and reading your book has to be simply put, has to be put in a way that people are going to resonate because again to your point if it's too complicated it's too busy it's too confusing people maybe it's too good to be true how can i trust that and trust that immediately and and maybe i don't know whether there is a sort of a number to this but do we have a a mean time in which we can maybe engage our audience i, I guess that might be dependent on what medium we're trying to connect with them on is, is there is there an ideal time to connect with yeah um that yeah that that's going to probably depend on a host of different factors like when we would let's say we were dealing with a client and they would say what's the best time to send an email and i was like, well it just depends right like who's your audience mm -hmm. we worked with um grand central terminal for years and years and we talked about email programs with them and they were saying okay well, we want to send a, a weekly email about like our events or promotions, whatever it'll be. Um, when should we send it? Well, I was like, for you guys, you know, who's your audience? Your audience is a lot of, a lot of them are, are commuters that are waking up at 5 a.m. and getting on a train and they're going to be sitting on the train for two hours and then making their plans for the day that way. So your emails will probably go out at like 4 a.m. Your emails would be at the, okay. at, you know, in somebody's inbox before they get on that train, that early commuter train. But sending an email at 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. is not going to help you if you are, let's say, like a restaurant talking about lunch. Because if you, you know, if you are telling someone about your lunch special and you send them at 4 or 5 a.m., 
people aren't thinking about lunch. Mm -hmm. They are, that gets buried in their inbox and there are a hundred other emails before them. And so, you know, that's, that's not going to help them. So you want to send that lunch email at like 1045 or 11 AM where somebody is beginning to be like, what am I going to do later for lunch? Yeah. So, but, or, but if you, um, you know, if you're a B2B business, you want to be sending it during a weekday. If you're talking about hobbies or, or, you know, sports or whatever, you might want to send it on a weekend because it'll end up being um, uh, more relevant to that mm -hmm. audience. So that's just talking about email. But yeah, it, it always, it'll always depend on who your audience is and what your message is. Yeah, I'm conscious of time. So we'll probably wrap up shortly. Do we have five minutes? Do we have a few minutes? Yeah. We... Okay, cool. So, so question, so simply put, what I like about it is it's not just for marketeers. So if you're a marketeer, definitely they should be getting this. But actually, it's for me, it's for non-marketeers, anybody that wants to, I guess today, everybody's an entrepreneur. Everybody wants, to, whether we exist within a business or we, we're doing it for real for ourselves. So would you say that, simply put, if you want to improve your marketing, this is something where you're going to learn frameworks, you're going to learn key initiatives that will really make things all clearer for them? Absolutely. So absolutely. I uh, I said before, this will live on a marketing shelf if you go mm -hmm. to the bookstore and you look for it, but it will uh, be broadly applicable to anybody who has something to uh, to share with the world. If, you, or if your job uh, or your passion is to inform or persuade, then the principles and the lessons and the science in here are going to be, uh, are going to be useful. Okay, fantastic. And where can people get the book? Where's the best place? So you can buy the book wherever books are sold, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, um, or you can go to uh, bookshop.org, which is the resource of a bunch of independent booksellers. You, if you're interested, if you're curious about the book, you can go check out my website, bengutman.com, B-E-N-G-U-T-T-M-A-N-N. -N. Uh, I spell it out because there's two T's and two N's and um, it's not very minimal of me to have two N's on my last name, but that's just how it is. In case I spell it wrong as well. <laughs> Likewise. Um, and uh, if you go check it out there and you and you click around to the resources tab, you, you can actually see um, I do have the the book, uh, the first part of the book, the first chapter of the book available for download. You can check that out as well. Good. And then, and then, and if you're curious, um, you know, click the click, click the links there to go buy the book or uh, sign up for the email I send every Tuesday uh, as well, which has some lessons from this. Okay, fantastic. And what I will do, I, I will get all the links and put them on the show notes. So it'd be super easy for people to get awesome. the book, buy the book, find out a little bit more about you. And I guess you've already given me the answer. People want to maybe work with you, hire you, website. Would that be the best place? Website's the best place. Uh, I've tried to limit my time on other social media platforms as much as I can, but you can find me on LinkedIn and you can find me on my website. Those are the best places to go. Okay, fabulous, fabulous. And I think this is the last question. So the last question is the recurring question. So, so, so Ben, if you could invite three inspirational people for dinner, they can be a liable past. Who, who would you invite? So, uh, I would start. I would have Jim Henson, okay. who is yeah. the creative force behind the Muppets. I, I think he is one of the most interesting uh, creators that I have um, I've ever learned about. And obviously, I, I appreciate his mm. his uh, his creative output from the Muppets to Sesame Street to Fraggle Rock and everything else. But uh, I read his biography a number of years ago, and and it was it was very impactful the way uh, some of the lessons I learned from that. So I also recommend that book. Go, go look up Jim Henson's biography. I forget the name of the author off the top of my head. Um, second would be Marie Curie, who is the only person to have won the Nobel Prize in both physics and chemistry, I believe. Uh, and I got a chance to tour her workshop in Paris a few years ago, and it was very, very cool. And I think she's one of the smartest people ever live. And then lastly is just to make it a little more fun, I'll put Larry David in there uh, uh, from you know Kirby Enthusiasm. Larry, uh, you, you want to be you want to be a good conversation. Oh uh, yeah, okay, that would be that would be a really interesting dinner. That'd be a really interesting dinner. Ben, you know, it's been an absolute blast. Thank you for filling in the blank spots that I had in terms of my knowledge about um, how to simplify messaging and marketing. So thank you so much. Thanks so much, Paul. I had a blast. I uh, appreciate you having me. No, Kurt, you're very welcome. And thank everybody for tuning into this episode of My Perfect Failure. Always looking 
to grow the show. So please do share this episode far and wide, particularly if you know people that are looking to improve their marketing skills. They need to keep it simple when they want to know how to do that. Definitely share this episode with them. And your feedback is most welcome. We're keen to hear about the things you like and equally the things the things you don't like. So you can find me, uh, Paul, at myperfectfailure.com or you can find me via the contact page and website. So take care for now. Bye. Thanks for listening to My Perfect Failure podcast. Be sure to visit www.myperfectfailure.com to join the conversation. Subscribe to our podcast on iTunes or Google Play. Look out for our next episode.